Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, Making Hybrid Working Work with Lorna Helps. We talk about wanting to go to Newcastle University way more than becoming a doctor, cutting through challenges in workshops by painting pottery, and being told she couldn't start a business as she didn't have the entrepreneur gene. Lorna is the founder of Vibrant Thinking, which helps organisations implement hybrid working to transform their workplace. Prior to starting her own business, she worked at Procter & Gamble for 17 years. She was based in Newcastle, but was part of teams based in London and Geneva, so has had some understanding of the challenges of hybrid working where teams are not in the same physical location. With vibrant thinking, she combines her experience at P&G with unlocking creativity and innovative thinking within people to get better solutions for the client organisation. Hello, Lorna, thank you ever so much for coming on the podcast. It's lovely to have you here. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So our first question that we ask everybody, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? So, yes, I did, or at least I thought I did. (laughs) So (laughs) I wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up. Uh, and absolutely everything was, you know, all A-levels were chosen on that basis. And then it transpired at A-level results time when I didn't get the grade I needed on physics. That actually I wanted to go to Newcastle University way more than I wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Got quite so, a draw, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> the North East was where I wanted to be. Mm. Um what was it, would you say about what was it about Newcastle then? Why? Uh, so both my parents are from from like my mum grew up yes. in Desmond and my dad grew up in Walkworth, which is where I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, and our, all of our family holidays were up north, and I just loved the beaches, the countryside, the people, everything. It was you know that was the draw. I fell in love mm-hmm. with the place, knew that I was I was I was coming home as far as I was concerned. Love Walkworth. It's a bloody marvellous castle. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> so what was it, what was about being a doctor? Where did that come from? Mm. I'm never quite sure which came first, the kind of belief that science was what I was good at or whether or not being a doctor drove those choices. Mm. Um, either way, I do know that the science that side of things what I liked about science was that there are right and wrong answers and you don't need mm. to have an opinion. <laughs> mm. And it took me quite a long time to realise, actually, I'm not a natural scientist. <laughs> <laughs> my, my attention to detail is not good, which is kind of what you need. Um, mm. And it's taken me a while to kind of, uh, you know, really uh, acknowledge myself as being creative. Mm. <laughs> Um, I always very firmly walked away from anything that was creative or artistic. Mm. Um, With you on that one. Yeah. Um, But I have, you know, discovered it is possible to be, well, I am creative. I do think creatively. Um, And probably science was not the right choices (laughs) to make. But I don't, you know, I did them and I enjoyed them. But I think, you know, the moment where I, kind of had that realisation was when I was doing my microbiology degree in Newcastle Mm -hmm. and sitting having coffee with people just we just had a seminar um, tutorial and these people were so excited uh, about the topic of cell walls Uh, I mean really they were just completely engrossed and you know couldn't couldn't kind of talk quick enough to kind of share their views and opinions and there were two things I realised there one, uh, that it was possible to feel that passionate about a topic. It was something I'd never really felt. And it, it was like an eye-opener to me that, like, I needed to find that. Mm. Um, and secondly, that, that microbiology was definitely not it. For me, I was just <laughs> left with cold. Um, which is when I, so I ended up changing courses and started psychology that was far more 
um, me. Really mm. loved that. Yeah, it's interesting what you said about the whole science being there's a right and wrong. Um, psychology is literally the opposite of that, isn't it? If it's like some research says this, some research says that. So the opinion is somewhere in the middle. Probably more research is needed was pretty much what I wrote for three years, four yes. years. Yeah, I, yeah. Although interestingly, I still stuck to the you know the more science end of the psychology. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, psychopharmacology was <laughs> one of the <laughs> one of the areas that I, which was all about rats and brains and um, yeah. Um, but equally, you're right. It was it was the start then of me kind of having it, the, the well. It could be this. It might not be that. It could, mm-hmm. You know that that um, there's always a bit of a there's no definites in psychology, no. um, and uh, and I and I as a as a degree, I loved it. I you know I found it fascinating. Um, you know, but always knew that I didn't want to do it as a job. <laughs> 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 it was like it's great. It's very interesting to do, but I'm I want to go and work at Procter and Gamble because that's I'd had. The I'd been lucky enough to have an experience working there for three months mm-hmm. in between changing courses, and they um, I loved it because they invested in me. Mm-hmm. Given that I was a temp, very clearly a temp, they invested in me and um, taught me things, showed me how to do things, um, trusted me to write reports. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is, you know, if this is what they do when it's just a temp, imagine what it would be like working there as a mm. as an employee. Mm. Um, which is, you know, I then was like, right, this is where I'm going to just keep applying for P&G until they have me. <laughs> sit outside. Keep showing up. Yeah, I did. It's me again. <laughs> <laughs> it's me again. Um, which had I, you know, I applied for brand, I applied for product supply, I applied for sales. Uh, none of which, by the way, if I'd ever got those jobs, I would have been crucified within six months of being there. So it was, you know, I then, what the job I got was in the media department, um, which was a brilliant department to be in. It was a maverick department within p and and that's what I loved about it. Um, you know, we were all very different and we all did, did things quite differently not the typical png way so i was allowed to be myself mm. but within a structured big corporate mm. um and i'm not you know i would describe my career at png as a roller coaster of a ride in that there are ups and downs within it but overall there's a lot of up there i now look back and think i'm very lucky to have had that experience because i do understand what it's like to work in corporate. I understand the stresses and I can use that to kind of um, reinvent the workplace, which is which is really what I'm trying to do now mm. um, with my company Vibrant Thinking, um, which is about helping uh, organisations set themselves up for success in hybrid working, So, that, which I see very much as the future of work. Mm. Yes. So how long were you at Procter & Gamble? Uh, 17 years in total big chunk of my life <laughs> but there must have been some really fascinating um i mean it's obviously a big company lots of things happening lots of products different markets so i can imagine that it must be quite exciting if you're in a, a maverick department within a structure with lots going on that you must get to see quite a bit as well we did get, yeah, we did. And again, you know, I look back at the responsibility that we had. <laughs> um, like, <laughs> well, you know, it's like we, you know, when I started there, we, the department was responsible for negotiating all the TV deals and the print deal, all the media deals, print deals, for placing mm. advertising. So we're talking millions that we were responsible for. I never, at the time, never it kind of wasn't that big a thing. Mm. <laughs> I think what I love most was the opportunities it gave me. So I was based in Newcastle. The media team was based in Newcastle. But all of the brand teams were down in Surrey, or at least they were after about five years and the Gosworth office closed down. Um, 
So we will work our team. So most of the people I work with on a daily basis were either in Surrey or Geneva. Um, and all of the people, all of the agencies were in London. and All of the people we negotiated with were in London. But it was, it gave, it's a great experience to be able to work with a team that isn't sitting next to you and learning how to build those relationships from afar and how mm. to um, really invest. I mean, it's an investment, um, but it would, you know, it paid off for me. I mean, I remember the moment when I realized that um, working on the relationship, showing where I added value, everything from afar really worked off, worked, had, had paid off because one of the assistant brand managers from laundry rang me and said, I need to talk to you about the media plan and make sure that you've approved it because my boss won't co- have a conversation with me until I've spoken to you. He's refusing to, because so as in the brand manager was like, there's no point in having a discussion with me about this until you're presenting it as a, this is approved by Lorna in the media department. And it was only by showing up on the phone, <laughs> um, building those relationships, mm-hmm. that people start to value what you're inputting. Um, which is much harder to do than if you're just sitting next to somebody. But actually, I think it lasts much longer as mm. well. Mm. Yeah, you can you can totally see the link between vibrant vibrant thinking. I lost the ability to speak today. Apologies, um, and your experience that you're you know supporting organisations with now compared to what you learnt almost by accident um (laughs) because that's how you had to work you know that remote working was how you worked yeah and we and we would never call it hybrid working you know it was just that was it's just how you work which is why I also think you know hybrid working everyone refers to it as being it's new I see it very much as this is a scaling it's massive scaling of something that's existed Mm. in all companies really but but this, that doesn't stop it having its challenges because mm-hmm. scaling that fast brings you know is brings its own challenges. But it's not new. We actually have a lot of the knowledge there. We don't need to go and re- reinvent the wheel. We need to look at what works in yep. those situations and how to apply it on a massive scale. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to be. <clears throat> excuse me. It's going to be interesting to see. It's almost, and we've talked to a number of people, haven't we, that the pandemic has, it's, so I agree, it's been there previously hybrid working, but it's been, the word we've heard a lot is an accelerant of having people working from home when we said they couldn't before, it wasn't possible, oh no, it is possible, and having that choice to say, well, we're not saying you only work from home or you only can work in the office, it's the that choice element of, well, actually, I'm going to avoid Mondays and Fridays because they're the worst days for traffic, whatever it may be. So I think it's going to be an exciting next couple of years, really, I think, for what, what might happen. Yeah, I, de- I definitely think this is not something that's going to happen, like be fixed overnight. I mm. kind of worry that some people think it's, you know, we can just put something in place and that's it. Because um, mm-hmm. actually it's it's going to be needed to be sought out and then you're going to need to put things in, you know, you're going to need to put strategies in place, but then adapt them as you go, as you mm-hmm. learn. Um, but if there were, I think there are, so for me, I think there are two really critical, critical aspects that people need to be kind of focusing on right now. Mm-hmm. One of which is actually talking to their employees and understanding. That almost sounds revolutionary. <laughs> I know, revolutionary. <laughs> talking, yes, talking to them and understanding what, um, you know, if they, in an ideal world, how would they want to work generally? You know, it's not a like, I want to only work these certain days in the office or home, but, you know, mm. what flexibility would you want to have? Mm. Um, and understanding why as well, um, what's driving that. Um and I think organisations might be surprised because certainly a lot of com- sort of research that I've done talking to different friends that are in different organisations, the one thing that was really worrying me at the moment is how many assumptions are being mm. made about what their employees will want and therefore what solutions need to be put in place. And I'm like, you can't, 
you can't put solutions in place till you know what the issues are that you know what are the things that you're are, are going to be worried about what are the challenges and I, I think you know it is abs- you should be having those conversations right now mm. because even if people are worried about you know, don't want to go back into the office right now, they will have a good feel for what they want to do long term. You know, take take mm-hmm. kind of the right now feeling if I don't want to be in crowds and I don't want to be in the office. They will be able to say, actually, if COVID wasn't here, I'd want to work five days a week in that office because I have hated it. Or the actually, you know, it's the flexibility that I want. Whatever it may be, people have a very good feel for it right now. And you should be talking to them. Mm. And the second um, aspect is starting to build a culture of ownership, by which I mean um, people make decisions um, through the lens of what is actually as if they were an owner of the company. Mm. Um, and it's something that runs really deep in PNG, and it's actually very empowering for an individual because. It's, there is an implied trust there then from the organisation that you're going to make the right decision and that they don't need to step in all of the time to tell you what decision to make. Mm. So if you, I, hybrid working will fail unless you have that ownership culture because that allows people, that allows the organisation to know that the individuals are making it through that that lens of what's the right decision to make um if you know if i own this company would i make the effort to go into this into the meeting in you know into the office to have that meeting mm-hmm. or is is it better to do it from home but if they're making it as if they were the owners of the organization they will make the right decision and you don't need to tell them no it's difficult but i think there's a lot of organisations because they don't have that you know, sense of shared power, autonomy, decision making. And the way some organisations have, have been run, it's literally you sit there, you do this, 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 this way. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of a if you leave early for whatever reason or if you want to go and you know watch a school play or whatever there's always almost a sort of fear of asking yeah and and um it's so it's the one thing um that i you know i've recently been talking to a lot of people ex png is and it's, mm. that is the one aspect that we didn't we miss most when you come out of PNG because yeah. we didn't know that how lucky we were no. until coming out and realizing <laughs> that doesn't happen everywhere. No. Um, but I think, you know, for me, hybrid working is a massive opportunity to get that right mm. throughout as many organizations as possible because it has so many benefits for both organization and employees. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, we're at this point of change where people are saying well I don't know you know we don't know what to do we don't know how to manage it and that you know therefore I think um, I know it's not only me that talks like this that Mm -hmm. that, you know (laughs) um, this is an opportunity to make it a better workplace um, to put to change the cultures and and, um, you know embed things that perhaps weren't possible in the past and it's you know it's because it because it's happening everywhere and there are no answers. I think it is a huge, huge opportunity yeah. to make it better. Absolutely agree. I was at a, a women's conference um, and Erin Brockovich was speaking and she called it the Great Reset. So it's almost like be careful what you bring from the old world into the new world. You know, really think about if it's, you know, Marie Kondo, it, does it bring you joy? <laughs> or is it just the way we've always done things? <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, and I, I am hopeful that there is that there, there, that um, organisations are listening, and mm. I mean, I'm actually speaking at a Management Today event on the 12th of May, mm-hmm. um, and you know the whole thing is about the future of the future of the work and reinventing the workforce, um, and you know as part of that I'll be talking about um, how really to get the, to the root cause of what is not good in work now um and how to change that 
going forward in the future and to make hybrid working a success and the things that you need in place and what mm. you can do. But there are other, you know, there are, there are one of the other speakers is some is the chief uh, HR officer from Unilever. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think she's going to be really interesting to listen to because I know that Unilever are further ahead than us, not, not us, us in generally. <laughs> um, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing, you know, what her take on it has mm. been in terms of how how they've managed to get further ahead, how they've, you know, what what's happened to their culture and how they've set things up. Um, yeah. So how can we how can we get tickets? Can we share the link or? Uh, yes, I can share the link. Excellent. Yes. yes, I'll put those in the show notes. That sounds like a good thing. Excellent, because mm-hmm. it sounds fascinating. Okay, so let's take you back in time a little bit. It's a really curious how you got from P and G with your billions of pounds of budget, um, and how how you how you ended up running your own business. Uh, so as I as I mentioned earlier, you know it was a roller coaster of a ride with P and G, and mm. towards the end, it was very much on a very steep down. Um, and I, you know, I, by then my daughter was three or four. Um, I mean, you know, she she noticed when I wasn't there and she noticed when I was stressed coming home from work. I was mm-hmm. also it was a time when I was doing work I didn't really enjoy, um, you know, have very little purpose in. Um, and I kind of I, I was lucky enough to, to be able to take a year out to um, to kind of really think. And I, I took the year out with, an, with, think, with a view of, I will use this time to explore what I want to do after mm-hmm. P&G, because I know it isn't going to be in the media world. Um, and the idea of pottery painting, which I had never done at that point, wouldn't go away. Um, so I kind of thought, what would I need if I was going to start a pottery painting business? It would be a kiln. So I've Googled kilns. And came up with the website of uh, what's now the people who are now my supplier, who run weekend courses on how to start your own pottery painting business. So I found myself booking onto that, ringing my mum and saying, could you have Francesca for the weekend? And then telling my husband that that was what we were doing when he came back from work. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And um, we went on the course and, you know, it was brilliant. Um, I loved it. They talked to you non-stop about running the business um we were, we were in a, quite a small room no windows um but at the same time as them talking to us we were being we were they also showed us how to do pot, different pottery painting techniques and what i couldn't believe is how energized i was at the end of that session having you know at the end of each day having been talked out for 10 hours um which I would normally be on my knees at if I'd mm. been a PNG training course, but I just it just um, I just felt so energized, and I was also this was a point for me of like really enjoying being creative and being really proud of the results that I had. It was like and and it's an instant pride a boost, mm. um, and I was like this you know this has definitely got legs. Um, we're starting a business, which my father said. You can't start a business. We're not entrepreneurs in this family. Um, <laughs> didn't have the entrepreneurial gene, did you? Know? Yes, yeah, didn't have it. Um, in fairness to him, he did. You know, he did come around very quickly and was one of my best supporters. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know, I led the way for when my brother then announced that he was also becoming an entrepreneur. <laughs> it's in the blood. It really it's is in the blood. Yes. Um, but I, you know, I, although the business that I started was rainbow pottery painting and it was all about hand and footprints for babies, I always knew that I wanted to take it back into corporate because I could see, you know, the at the time of how I felt and how squashed out of shape I felt mm. in P&G, um, I knew that pottery could work on so many levels Mm. to unlock creativity in people to boost well-being to um have you know find creative solutions to challenges um you know find you know really get people into a different thinking space because that's mm-hmm. what it does to you and you know when you you're in that think different thinking space lots of barriers come down mm. um you know 
so many more ideas come forward. Um, and it's, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, in the last couple of years, I've transitioned from rainbow pottery to vibrant thinking. You do do pottery, don't you, still, in organisations? I do, yes, I do. So vibrant, th- sorry, just to be clear, the, it is really... <laughs> <laughs> yes the vibrant thinking um in, is absolutely based on the pottery painting aspect the whole idea that that can um you know doing two out you know just two hours with me doing a workshop you can cut through a, a lot of challenges and come up with very specific solutions um and at the end of the end of that session you'll also then have a mug normally that will remind you of what you're going to be doing to address those solutions over the coming months um and people you know they come in to a session generally either not sure what to what on earth is going to happen <laughs> or or st- feeling that they've been forced into something yeah. by their boss mm. but at every session i just see them all relax come down into the now forget about work they're not you know it just gets you out of that day-to-day thinking and worrying and Mm -hmm. you know as I said into this completely different thinking space um and I love it I love seeing that um and how good people feel afterwards and people often say you know not only have they enjoyed the session and they've got you know great actions coming out of it but they also then say that once they go back to work, they're far more productive than they would have been if they hadn't have had that session because mm. it's completely, it's grounded people and focused them. Yeah, yeah. it does. It sounds magical. Yeah, I love it. You go in and you can see all this skeptic. Oh, there's a skeptic. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's yeah. totally still on their face. <laughs> it's like, he's clearly raging. <laughs> I imagine Absolutely. them being the most excited by the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it's so sad though isn't it because we you know going back to school we love this type of thing you know coming home and showing our parents the like Christmas decorations we'd made and I've got all of, all of Oliver's is still wheeled out every year and a lot of them are absolute pony but <laughs> it's like lovely to to kind of have that touch point and you know this is what I made and humans are yeah. naturally creative and that gets squished out of us and I think you mentioned that that for your 17 years you felt like you were totally bent out of shape yes yep mm. you know, oh you know I do wonder I, I look back now and think could I I think that's one of the interesting things about coming out of PNG is that one thing it allows you to do is to separate what was you and what was PNG as a corporate that was impacting on the issues and I you know if I if I could go back in time, uh, it would be I would like to do that knowing where my not weaknesses, but knowing knowing um, where I could have done things differently and got different results and felt better as a result of it, rather than you know perhaps finding it too easy just to say oh it's because of the, the PNG culture, it's just because it's so competitive. That's that's why, and and you know I'm it, it was very competitive. Uh, don't get me wrong that doesn't change but how I could have responded to that I think now I know myself better Mm -hmm. I could have done it differently but we'll never know and what I am grateful for is that I have that insight to be able to apply to different organizations yeah definitely I find it absolutely fascinating where we speak to a lot of like people coming out of the NHS and starting their own businesses and it probably takes three or four years for them to sort of unravel through that mm. through the culture and actually start figuring out what they want to do as well so I think it's a similar it's, transition I totally I got divorced and um left P&G within two months of each other wow uh and I can tell you that the, I got over the divorce far quicker <laughs> than leaving P&G it really did take uh, four or five years for me to decompress mm. my my mission I guess my mission is to help companies change the workplace from something that drains you to something that gives you energy that is that's like world if I could do that as world domination Mm. job done yes please I think the world needs that (laughs) (laughs) um 
and I, I guess how I'm doing it is at the moment just um, making myself visible uh, with, as I said, this Management Today conference and um, also on Enterprise Nation, doing talks on there and uh, podcasts. Podcasts, absolutely. Mm. I'm looking for really forward thinking organizations that really see this as the opportunity that I see it as and are mm. prepared to go through what will undoubtedly be a rocky road but one that is worth it in the end mm. um, to figure out how to, to make hybrid working work and allow their organizations to thrive That's exciting stuff mm. so yes you can imagine a world where that happens wonderful it would be wonderful so thank you very much for your mm. contribution <laughs> 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 thank you <laughs> yeah so we'd love to get you in for one of our um work pirates um, gatherings if you could be a speaker that would be brilliant mm. as well i'd love to be excellent, we'll excellent. That up. yes we will so now i think it's time to lower the tone with excellent. our <laughs> quick fire round <laughs> questions james would you take it away oh i like this one question number one if your life had a mascot, what would the mascot be? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's a difficult one as well. I'm going to say squirrel. <laughs> and I'm going to say, we're going to steal this un unashamedly from a, from a LinkedIn post that I saw last week about how intelligent squirrels are with their ability to be able to... Um, hoard nuts and not eat them all at, at the summer when there's so many of them that they hoard them so that over winter they are then um looked after the ability to think ahead and not immediate not at all be about now this minute mm. uh, to be able to plan that is good. and i just like it and i like squirrels they're cute aren't they yeah, yeah. and a bit dangerous if you get too close <laughs> yes so yeah Adopt that as a mascot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Okay, okay. Question number two is, what's the best sandwich you've ever had? Oh, I, yeah, okay. Uh, the steak baplet from our local pub in Episton where I grew up. Um, it was uh, it was absolutely standard. Like my brother and I, when we were teenagers, early 20s, when we went there quite a lot, and steak baplet would sort out all cures hangovers etc for lunch and a mm. pint obviously <laughs> oh, good. it's funny we asked him um, we asked all of my little in um over the weekend if we won the lottery um uh, what would we do and we, we figured out that he pretty much wants to steak bakes every day um, <laughs> so, so, so it's on the way back from rugby yesterday wasn't it and uh yeah i said well oliver you are what you eat he goes yes so i'll just be made of steak <laughs> and gravy <laughs> so yes i think he's i think he's on your wavelength with that one. <laughs> excellent <clears throat> question number three what would your perfect holiday be Oh, God, just lying on a beach somewhere with a book. Well, with about 10 books, because I read a book a day when I'm on holiday, mm. um, with no child. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come? <laughs> no, any holidays, really, is when you're a mum, is my view. It's just the same issues taken somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then without, without the equipment that you've got yeah. at home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's brilliant. Cool. So if we could take you back to your 18-year-old self, recently disappointed at the fact that physics was really, really difficult, um, but Newcastle was the plan, what what advice would you give to you? I think it's, so it would be to believe in yourself more. Um, mm. You know, your opinions and your ideas are actually good. Uh, and not, I mean, you know, People value them um, and they are worth sharing. Don't hide them away. Absolutely. I say that a lot. Just think of all those people that you're not helping, that aren't getting help that they need because you're not telling people. Exactly. Mm, best way to view yeah. it. Awesome. So for our listeners, best place to follow Lorna, get, to, get on LinkedIn, search for Lorna Helps and... 
she will pop up. You can see what she's up to, follow her posts, and we'll put all the links in the show notes as always. So that just remains to say thank you very much for joining us today, Lorna. Thank you very much for having me. I really loved it. Mm. <laughs> We've enjoyed us chatting. too. I'm looking forward to seeing you become more and more visible. Mm. Um, and the, the help that the world organisations so desperately need. Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody. (laughs) 